Hello, I'm Alex Akavon, and you're listening to May It Please the Court. Well, I think it's very evident that the law is unenforceable. I think if you had a policeman under every bed in the state of Connecticut, they still could not prove anything. We are continuing, maybe illegally, but we are continuing our program. Have you ever stopped to wonder why there are no states that ban birth control? The person you just heard was a woman named Estelle Griswold. The illegal program she was referring to was giving access to contraception for married couples in the early 1960s. Now, a bunch of news stories today involve the contraception issue. One recent debate has to do with the Affordable Care Act, a.k.a. Obamacare requirement, that employers provide birth control as part of their employees' health care plans. A lot of businesses seek an exception to this rule on religious grounds. And yet, despite how many people are out there who oppose birth control, not one state in the United States has a law that forbids the use of contraception. But they used to. As recently as 1965, a lot of states restricted the use of contraceptives in some way or another. And it's probably not the states you're picturing. At the time, one of the states with the strictest anti-contraceptive law was Connecticut. That is, until Estella Griswold came along. Faced with the possibility of jail time, Griswold provided patients with access to contraception anyway. And since she stuck to her guns, the reason that no states ban contraception today is because they can't. But like our old Baker friend Joseph Lochner, whose arrest had birthed an entire era of legal reasoning, Estelle Griswold's fight to legalize birth control would steer American history down a whole new road, with the Supreme Court's recognition of a new right guaranteed by the 14th Amendment's Due Process Clause. A fundamental right to privacy. The basic disagreement stems from the differences in the moral attitudes towards birth control. And I say that is purely a moral judgment which cannot be measured by objective circumstances. This was a question solely within the responsibility of the state legislatures. And it was not a question to be entertained by this court. There is a right of privacy in the Constitution, a general right of privacy, a right of privacy derived from the due process come from the 14th Amendment. Estelle T. Griswold versus Connecticut. Chief Justice, may it please the court. It was a new time in America. Since the Due Process Clause had made its latest dramatic appearance in 1937 with the official overturn of Lochner v. New York, the United States had gone through a lot of changes. The 1940s had brought the Second World War. Then the baby boomer generation took its first steps into the world. The biggest moment from a Supreme Court perspective was, without a doubt, the Brown v. Board of Education case in 1954, which brought racial segregation in schools to an end. And during all of this time, the court stayed pretty quiet about due process. Because the court no longer recognized a liberty to contract, FDR was free to start regulating businesses, establishing the foundation for the economic system we have now. Popularity for the original Lochner case started to plummet. The case's biggest advocates on the court, the Four Horsemen, had all died by 1946. And everyone thought that the idea of substantive due process had died with them. Substantive due process is the concept that the 14th Amendment can be used to invalidate state laws based on the court's interpretation of liberty. 
Business lawyers in the early 20th century loved this concept because they wanted to strike down any law that regulated businesses for violating a liberty to contract. Progressives, meanwhile, especially in the 1930s, hated this reasoning. While they mostly complained about the freedom to contract idea, they often critiqued justices who had imposed their own economic views on the whole country. But something happened in 1960 that changed everything. The birth control pill hit the market. For the first time, women had the option of buying a pill that could stop them from conceiving. With a lower risk of unwanted pregnancy, a lot more people started to explore this taboo concept of premarital sex. But, as you might expect, many people had a problem with it. People were talking about sex a lot more openly than they had been in the 1950s. And not only were they talking about it more, they were doing it. And not only were they doing it, but they had no intention of getting pregnant. So a lot of state laws restricted access to contraception. But Connecticut went so far as to make any use of a contraceptive device illegal. So here's where Estelle Griswold steps in. She was the executive director of the Plant Parenthood League of Connecticut. And as you heard, she opposed laws that prohibited contraception. So she got together with an attorney named Catherine Rohrabach and came up with a plan. They had already tried to challenge the law in the judicial system, but the Supreme Court had dismissed their case because they had failed to establish whether these laws were actually being enforced. So basically, they needed to prove that the state of Connecticut was willing to arrest someone for violating the anti-contraception, also known as the Comstock Law. Griswold stepped up to the plate. She and her colleague Lee Buxton opened a birth control clinic in New Haven, Connecticut. Despite the fact that the state had outright prohibited any drug or instrument for the purpose of preventing conception, Griswold made her clinic open for couples who wanted birth control. But she and her legal team played it very carefully. The clinic was only focused on married couples. They knew they'd have a more convincing argument if the state was stopping married couples from using contraception. As I said, the idea of sex before marriage at the time was pretty risque still. They didn't want nine old men to feel like they were encouraging premarital affairs by striking down anti-contraception laws. It was one thing to tell people to wait until marriage to have sex, but it was another to tell them that once they were married, they could only have sex to procreate. And so, with the clinic open for business, Griswold and Buxton awaited their fate. On the uh, 24th of November... We issued two warrants, one against Estelle Griswold and the other against Dr. C. Lee Buxton, in violation of the contraceptive statute. Griswold and Buxton were arrested and later convicted. They were fined $100 each. This conviction was upheld by the Connecticut Supreme Court. Now they had the proof they needed that this statute was indeed being enforced. So they appealed their case to the U.S. Supreme Court, and it was time for phase two of their plan. Warabak and the rest of the legal team now had to convince the court why contraception laws were unconstitutional, at least as applied to married couples. But where in the Constitution does it say that a state cannot ban contraception? The word contraception is not in the Constitution. So Warabak had to find a new approach and pitch the argument as a privacy issue. Maybe the Constitution doesn't explicitly protect contraception rights, but it does protect privacy rights, right? So maybe access to contraception is part of that right to privacy. This was an effective strategy, but it posed a new problem. What part of the Constitution guarantees a right to privacy? 
Generally speaking, the Constitution certainly values privacy. We have constitutional rights against unlawful search and seizure, for instance. But where is there a right to privacy? I mean, it would have been ideal for Griswold if the Constitution said, the right of the people to make private, personal decisions about their lives shall not be infringed. But regrettably, it doesn't. So Rohrabach's team had to flesh out their argument from several different angles. They thought about using the First Amendment, which includes freedom of association. They also thought about the Ninth Amendment, which is rarely litigated, but says that nothing in the Constitution is intended to deny or disparage the rights retained by the people. So maybe the right to access contraception was an unenumerated right that was implicitly retained by the people. But then, someone brought up the Due Process Clause. Long ago, the pure capitalists of the court had repeatedly written precedent that established the idea of striking down laws that infringe on civil liberties. And even though the Lochner era was mostly about economic rights, some cases that involved substantive due process were never officially overturned. States still can't force parents to send their kids to public schools, for example, partly because of the 14th Amendment. So maybe substantive due process was right after all. Maybe there's no liberty to contract, But what about other liberties? Isn't a fundamental right to privacy the most important liberty there is? That was it. Their best chance. If successful, they could have every single contraception law struck down nationwide, all in one fell swoop. Oral arguments were set for March 1965. While Catherine Rohrabach had done a lot to get the case this far, she did not end up arguing to the Supreme Court. The legal team opted to go with someone with more oral argument experience to ensure that they could express their positions in the most palatable way. So they went with a man named Professor Thomas Emerson. Emerson's mission was to convince the Supreme Court to declare the Connecticut law and therefore all anti-contraception laws as unconstitutional. His key argument was the 14th Amendment's Due Process Clause. And so, for the first time in nearly 30 years, substantive due process was back. You're listening to May It Please the Court. On March 29, 1965, oral arguments in the case of Griswold v. Connecticut began. Sitting across from Professor Emerson in the courtroom were the nine men he had to convince. Justices Arthur Goldberg, Byron White, Potter Stewart, William Brennan, Tom Clark, William Douglas, Chief Justice Earl Warren, Hugo Black, and Justice John Marshall Harlan II, the grandson of John Marshall Harlan, who had dissented back in 1905 to the original Lochner case. Emerson was particularly interested in Justice Harlan II. Back when the court had originally refused to hear the case until there was proof that the anti-contraception law was being enforced, Justice Harlan had brought up the 14th Amendment. He said that when the court does hear the case, he would be open to using the Due Process Clause to strike down contraception bans. That gave Griswold's lawyers the inspiration they needed to make their arguments. Now, if you remember, Justice Harlan II's grandfather had rejected substantive due process, as it was argued in 1905. But at that time, the liberty at issue had been the freedom to contract. 
This was a new time, and the court's latest Harlan believed that the Due Process Clause could stop the government from infringing on certain civil liberties. Namely, a fundamental right to privacy. Emerson needed to do enough to convince the other justices that Harlan's reasoning was right. But it wouldn't be easy. Some of the justices would see this as a rebirth of Lochner reasoning, something they vowed never to allow again. But the justice who Emerson knew would be the most opposed to his arguments was Justice Hugo Black, the first man that FDR had nominated back in 1937. Black was the most senior justice on the court in 1965, and the only one who had actually been on the bench during the Lochner era. He had delivered the final blow to Lochner. He wasn't going to see its reasoning revived by another generation. And so, knowing what he had to do, Emerson started his arguments. And by the 1960s, these arguments were recorded, so we have actual audio clips of what Emerson said. First, he emphasized that they were limiting their case to married couples only. Next, he started talking about the due process clause. And here is where Justice Hugo Black steps in. These arguments were sounding all too familiar. He knew exactly what Professor Emerson was trying to do and called him out on it. Seems to me what you, someone has done here deliberately is try to force a decision on the broadest possible grounds of the meaning of due process speaking as a matter of substance and to have us weigh facts and circumstances as to the advisability of a law like this rather than leave it up to the legislature. Yes, Your Honor, but, but it, is not, it is not broad due process uh, in, in the uh, sense in which the issue was raised uh, in the 1930s. Uh, in the first place, this is not a regulation that deals with economic or commercial matters. Uh, and therefore, we say we are not asking this court to revive Lochner against New York. Or, or to overrule Nebbia or West Coast Hotel. Like you're asking us to follow the We're not asking the philosophy of that case. It sounds to me like you're asking us to follow the constitutional philosophy of that case. Emerson said that he was not arguing for Lochner to be brought back, because that had to do with economic rights. Here, he was talking about privacy rights. But Justice Black was not buying it. He heard an argument for substantive due process, a doctrine he had rejected ever since his first year on the court. And so then, Justice Black started to argue why he doesn't like substantive due process. Why justices shouldn't be able to tell states whether or not to pass certain laws. He might not agree with banning contraception, but it should be up to the people of Connecticut to decide whether or not they wanted to. So basically, he was against the Supreme Court inserting itself into matters that should be left up to the people. You insist that that's what we've got to decide this on, as I understand it. That we've got a right to set aside state laws that we think are arbitrary and capricious in our judgment. In, In the field of individual liberty, Your Honor... The laws in relation to this, uh, uh, to contraception, make no sense uh, whatever. Uh, Suppose one agrees with you, as I might. Does that give me the right to say that Connecticut can't have a different idea? Whether or not one agrees with Justice Black, he now found himself at the end of his career standing in the way of social progressives. He had been a liberal appointed by the Democrat FDR, who ended an era that prohibited government regulation of business. He had voted with his other colleagues to desegregate public schools. But the 1960s had brought sweeping change to the nation. And now he was one of the only justices to argue in favor of the state's right to regulate and prohibit contraception. But what's quite remarkable is that he predicted exactly where Emerson's argument would one day lead. Even though Emerson was only talking about contraception for married couples, 
Black foresaw that the same arguments could be used one day to legalize abortion. He specifically pointed out that with Emerson's logic, abortion bans could also be struck down as invading a woman's right to privacy. But Emerson was ready. He thought that argument could come up, and he knew that the court was not going to start striking down abortion bans. At least not yet. So Emerson kept the question solely focused on contraception for married couples. No, I, I think it would not, it would not cover the uh, uh, abortion laws uh, or the sterilization laws, Your Honor. Those, uh, those, uh, uh, that conduct does not occur in the privacy of the, of the home. In the privacy okay. of the- Some privacy is a rule, and the individual doesn't usually want it made known. Well, that aspect, that aspect of it is, is true, Your Honor, but, but uh, uh, those are offenses which uh, <clears throat> do not involve uh, the type of enforcement apparatus as to what goes on in the home uh, that... Uh, that part this, of it goes on in the home, undoubtedly. Uh, uh, part of it does, Your Honor, but the, but the, the conduct that is being prohibited is... Uh, uh, in the abortion cases takes place outside of the home normally. There is no violation of the sanctity of the home. When oral arguments were over, Emerson told Griswold that he was confident they would win 7-2. to two. He was spot on. On June 7, 1965, the Supreme Court issued its decision and declared the Connecticut Comstock Law, which had forbid contraception, unconstitutional. Estelle Griswold had won. She achieved what she set out to achieve, access to contraception for married couples. But she actually did a lot more than that. Her case officially established the modern recognition of a fundamental right to privacy, setting America on a brand new course of constitutional history. But even though seven justices had agreed to strike the law down, and even though they found a constitutional right to privacy, they could not agree on where this right comes from. Justice Goldberg, for example, had been most convinced by the Ninth Amendment argument. He did not see anywhere in the Constitution that discussed contraception, but thought it was one of the rights retained by the people. Meanwhile, Justice Harlan II and Justice White used the Fourteenth Amendment. Like he had argued a few years earlier, Justice Harlan believed that the Due Process Clause does protect certain civil liberties, which includes a fundamental right to privacy. He and Justice White concluded that the Connecticut law infringed on a married couple's right to privately decide whether or not they wanted children. And this was not something the state was allowed to deprive them of. Their argument and separate opinion would prove to be vital. But at the time... The court's official position came from Justice Douglas, who wrote the opinion. Rather than point to anywhere specific, Justice Douglas infamously argued that the right to privacy was found in the penumbras of the Constitution. Essentially, he said that even though the Constitution doesn't explicitly provide for a fundamental right to privacy anywhere, its general theme seems to prioritize privacy. The Fifth Amendment, for example, protects people from self-incrimination. The First Amendment protects each person's right to associate with whoever they want to. So to Justice Douglas, it was not a huge leap to interpret a fundamental right to privacy that stopped states from banning contraception. He did, however, specifically address the Fourteenth Amendment. Perhaps because Justice Black had explicitly brought up the Lochner analogy, the majority opinion acknowledged that Professor Emerson had invited the justices to use the due process clause. But, Justice Douglas said it was an invitation that the court would decline. And yet, it was an invitation that the court would accept one day. <laughs> 
In dissent, unsurprisingly, was Justice Black, with Justice Potter Stewart joining him. Stewart wrote the dissenting opinion and started it bluntly by proclaiming that he thought the Connecticut anti-contraception statute was an uncommonly silly law. But with that said, there was nothing in the Constitution that stops them from passing it. The penumbras, the Ninth Amendment, substantive due process, these were all too much of a stretch to be used to overturn a state law according to Justice Stewart. But whether they liked it or not, substantive due process had been resurrected. As of 1965, the Constitution protects a new type of liberty, a fundamental right to privacy, a right that has become the backbone of modern society. The Griswold decision got all married couples access to contraception, but that was just the beginning. Soon, it would be responsible for a whole lot more. We'll talk about what else the fundamental right to privacy meant for Americans when we discuss interracial marriage and the case of Loving vs. Virginia in Episode 5. May It Please the Court is produced by Untwist the Facts visit our website at www.untwistthefacts.com and follow us on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram at Untwist the Facts. I'm Alex Akavon, and thank you so much for listening.